The Enterprise D may have been as recognizable as your own living room, but behind the deceptively simple layout and plush Federation furnishings lie a few untold stories. So step into the turbo lift and head to deck one, because I, Marcus Bronzy, am here with Trek Culture with 10 Secrets of the Next Generation's Main Bridge. Number 10. Hilton in Space to convey Star Trek, the next generation's place in the future of the future, nearly a century after the events of Star Trek the original series, creator Gene Roddenberry requested the bridge of the Enterprise D be as streamlined and as comfortable as possible. The show's season one writer's bible, which was developed before the sets were even designed or constructed, described the bridge as a control and conference center. So with that directive, early sketches of the main bridge were developed by Starship designer Andrew Probert and featured couches, a conference table and chairs. It even had a balcony overlooking a massive view screen. According to Probert, the couches were my idea to provide more of a face-to-face -face conference environment for the main characters. The table idea, generated by the producers, I hated that because it wouldn't be logical to furnish a table where everyone would gather to discuss their situations. Ultimately, the hotel lobby-esque designs were abandoned in favour of a more straightforward reinterpretation of the TOS bridge configuration, though retaining the plush elements like the comfy laid back seats, soft upholstery on the walls and all of that carpeting too, to indicate that the Enterprise D was as much a living city in space as it was an exploratory quasi-military vessel. Number 9. The Buttons. They do nothing. Another of Gene Roddenberry's directives during the development of Star Trek The Next Generation was that the Enterprise D should appear as though it could be operated by just a few officers on the bridge, with far fewer manual controls like the multicolored buttons and switches of the original Enterprise. To that end, hundreds if not thousands of backlit graphics were devised by scenic artists Michael and Denise Akuda, favoring emulated touchscreen computer interfaces over buttons. Lovingly dubbed Okudagrams by TNG's art department, these backlit graphics gave the impression that the ship was filled with futuristic touchscreen computer controls. According to Rick Sternbach and Michael Akuda's Star Trek The Next Generation technical manual though, the LCAR style interfaces, which as I'm sure you know stand for Library Computer Access and Retrieval System, were relatively low tech. Most of our control panels and displays are large photographic transparencies designed by Mike Akuda and Carrie Thomas using Adobe Illustrator as well as conventional pen and ink techniques. These large sheets of film are mounted on plexiglass glass and backlit with the electronic blinkies by Star Trek's special mechanical effects department under the supervision of Dick Brownfield. The result is a very clean, high-tech look into our panels. So despite how expertly Commander Data or Ensign Crusher or Lieutenant Worf appear working at their controls throughout TNG's seven seasons, the bridge's computer controls had no set operating procedure and the buttons were mostly labelled with gibberish and in-house jokes and the initials of the show's production staff. According to Michael Akuda, in response to us on Twitter, he said, I talked with the cast about the style of hand movements and I was mostly concerned that they looked comfortable and efficient. Occasionally, Patrick Stewart would call me down to the stage and ask me which of the specific buttons to push for a scene, but mostly it was improv. Number 8. Places everyone. Throughout most of Star Trek The Next Generation, the bridge of the Enterprise D was distinguished by two straightforward stations. Flight Control, or CON, manned first by Lieutenant Geordie LaForge and then Ensign Wesley Crusher, or according to Marina Sirtis, anyone who happened to be passing by that day. The second forward bridge station was Operations, or Ops, which was famously manned by Lieutenant Commander Data. Aft of CON and Ops was the command center, with the chairs for the first officer, captain and ship's counselor, or medical officer. There was also additional seating on either side of those three chairs, but these benches were rarely used. Behind the command center was the horseshoe-shaped wooden tactical station operated by Worf, and then there were the aft bridge stations. During TNG's first season, the aft bridge stations were labeled Science 1, Science 2, Propulsion, Emergency, Manual Override, and Environment. However, these stations were juggled a bit before season 2. Following his promotion to Chief Engineer, Lieutenant Commander Geordie LaForge lost his permanent station on the bridge, spending most of his scenes down in engineering. To get LaForge in on some of that sweet, sweet main bridge action, TNG's set designers reworked the bridge stations to give LaForge his own dedicated aft console. While the Science 1 and Science 2 stations remained unchanged, the propulsion console was converted to Mission Ops, Emergency Manual Override changed to Environment, and the old Environment position converted to Engineering, Geordie's new station. Number 7. Dedication 
a tradition that began with Star Trek the original series and carried on throughout the Star Trek motion pictures into Star Trek The Next Generation was the inclusion of a dedication plaque on the bridge of the Enterprise. Aboard the Enterprise D, the dedication plaque was located on the forward starboard bulkhead next to the battle bridge turbo lift. Like the one seen in TOS, the Enterprise D's dedication plaque stated the ship's name, registry and motto to boldly go where no one has gone before. It also listed the date of launch, star date 40759.5 and the location of the ship's construction in divisions like command, engineering and warp technologies development. At least that's the in-universe explanation. Though the names were never really legible in TNG, the Starfleet officers listed on the ship's dedication plaque were actually behind the scenes staffers, including Captains Andrew Probert, Herman Zimmerman and Dan Curry as well as Admirals Rick Berman and Gene Roddenberry. Number 6. Saucer Separations Star Trek The Next Generation was filmed at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, California, with Stage 9 housing the interconnected corridor network that included the Enterprise D, Transporter Room, Sick Bay, Engineering, Cargo Bay and Junior Officers Quarters sets, while Stage 8 was where the main bridge, Captain's Ready Room, Senior Officers Quarters 10 Forward and the Observation Lounge were located. Despite the fact that, in-universe, the Observation Lounge was directly attached to the rear of the main bridge, the set for the conference room was actually not located where it should be. Unlike Captain Picard's ready room which was built directly attached to the main bridge, there simply wasn't enough space on stage 8 for a continuous bridge to observation lounge set, so the observation lounge was built separately just past Picard's ready room window. Luckily, following its use in Star Trek The Next Generation, the set was saved from demolition after Star Trek Generations and reused in Star Trek's first contact. Finally built directly into the Enterprise E's bridge and allowing the camera to shoot from the bridge into the observation lounge and out of those distinctive windows. Number 5. Captain Picard's Hydebed Unlike the observation lounge, which was supposed to be attached to the bridge but wasn't, Captain Picard's ready room was constructed directly next to the main bridge set, allowing for continuous action between the two compartments. As it appeared throughout TNG's seven seasons and Star Trek Generations, Picard's ready room was generally decorated with Jean-Luc's personal effects, including his copy of the Globe Illustrated Shakespeare and a model of his former command, the USS Stargazer. According to set blueprints but never captured on camera, the sofa in Picard's ready room had the very high-tech ability to pull out from the wall to become a bed. Unfortunately, TNG's Seven Seasons never gave us a look at Picard using his hider bed, but Star Trek's first contact came close, depicting the captain dozing on the couch in his ready room aboard the USS Enterprise E. Number 4. Activate Blue Screen Here's something you'll never be able to unsee. There isn't any glass in any of the windows aboard the Enterprise D. And no, that's not some joke about the transparent aluminium. No, whilst the windows in the Enterprise D did originally have glass in them, they frequently reflected lights and production equipment and were ultimately eliminated sometime before season two. From there on out, almost every window on Star Trek The Next Generation sets was just an open frame looking out into a black curtain covered in reflective glass stars. This same curtain was also used for the bridge view screen when a static space view was required. At other times, a blue screen was lowered in front of the view screen and the VFX shots were edited into the viewer in post-production. If the view screen was not in shot, they'd move everything out of the way and there would be more space for the cast and crew to move around between shots. Number 3. The Head Star Trek V The Final Frontier famously featured the only appearance of a toilet aboard a Starfleet vessel, and Star Trek Deep Space Nine made the occasional reference to waste extraction. But restrooms have mostly gone unseen in the Star Trek universe. However, the bridge of the Enterprise D did have a bathroom at least, well, some of the time. The Enterprise D bridge set featured six doors around its circumference. Two led to turbo lifts, another led to the dedicated battle bridge turbo lift, another led to Captain Picard's ready room, and another led to the observation lounge. All five of these doors were used by the command crew throughout Star Trek The Next Generation, but the sixth door was only ever shown being used by background actors. Located directly across from the observation lounge at the rear of the bridge, this sixth door was labelled Conference until sometime in TNG's seventh season when the signage was changed to Head, aka the bathroom. According to illustrator Rick Sternback's blueprints of the Enterprise D, there was indeed a small bathroom behind that door complete with two sinks and a toilet. Number 2. The Stolen Command Chair Like the bridge itself, Captain Picard's command chair saw a few revisions over the course of Star Trek The Next Generation's run, but was replaced entirely on two separate occasions. The first time the command chair was replaced occurred between seasons 1 and 2, when the main bridge set received a major refresh. 
The second time the chair was replaced, however, was for a much different reason. Just after the end of Star Trek The Next Generation, and with over two days before Star Trek Generations was scheduled to go into production, the movie's producers were horrified to discover that Captain Picard's chair had been nicked. Yes, stolen. This led to a mad dash by the property department, which was forced to work nearly round the clock to create a brand new captain's chair utilizing components of Picard's season one chair, which was thankfully still in their possession. Whilst it's hard to imagine someone nicking such a large prop from Star Trek, this happened once again. Yeah, that's right. During the filming of Star Trek Nemesis, thieves made off with Captain Picard's command chair from the Enterprise E, forcing the producers to shell out 15 grand for a brand new one. According to a Paramount Pictures executive in 2002 interview with People magazine, the theft of the Enterprise E command chair was an inside job. Number 1. Generations Second Generation Bridge the Enterprise D's bridge went through several minor updates over the course of Star Trek The Next Generation seven years, but the set was given an extensive overhaul courtesy of production designer Herman Zimmerman and illustrator John Eaves for Star Trek Generations, and according to Eaves, Herman wanted to make the bridge more functional. To accomplish that, we raised the captain's chair slightly, symbolically putting his authority higher than those sitting in the two chairs that were flanking him. And for functionality, we also split the ramps on either side of the commander center. We still had a ramp going down, but added two elevated stations, one against either wall where the crew members would work. We also replaced an alcove filled with lockers and storage panels with a new graphic station, courtesy of Mike Akuda, of course. And at one point, we had added some new stand-up stations behind the captain's chair where Worf works. It was a nice design, but it wound up being simply too much of a modification, so we dropped it. The reasons for the revamp were practical though. Though the highly detailed Enterprise D sets were great for looking at on normal televisions, they weren't great for 90-foot theatre screens. The wider aspect ratio also inspired Zimmerman to rework the bridge, adding in extra stations and computer terminals to either side of it, which allowed it to better fill the widescreen format. Ultimately, the redesigned and upgraded bridge didn't last that long, receiving heavy damage in the battle with the Duras sisters and subsequently crash sequence before being unceremoniously torn down after production on Generations wrapped. Some elements of the bridge were saved, including Worf's horseshoe tactical console and the command chairs which were sent to be displayed at Hollywood's Entertainment Museum until it was stolen, no they weren't stolen, until it was closed in 2007. The remaining elements of the Enterprise D bridge now reside back at home at Paramount Studios Archive. So there you have it. 10 Secrets of the Next Generation's Main Bridge. If you know any other secrets, feel free to let us know in the comments. Would love to do a part two of this one. And also, if you'd like to drop us a like and a subscribe, that would be fantastic. We're also on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Marcus Bronzy, M-A-R-C-U-S-B-R-O-N-Z-Y. And my podcast is wherever you can get your hands on those. And it's called Ain't Got A Clue.